I want to be on a reality show. Um, and I want to get an English boyfriend. Then she says, and this is where I was just like, Ey. this is so embarrassing for you. She says to Lizzie, do you know any famous guys? I'm single and I'm, I really love English men. Do you know anyone who's free? This is so embarrassing. Like, stop begging, get up off the floor. Quit groveling. Like, this is just humiliating to read. Do you know any famous guys? I'm single. Do you know anyone who's free? I'm free. Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody? Hello, how are you? Welcome to another episode of Revenge Review where we're going through Tom Bauer's revenge as an answer to spare. Now, you guys, this next couple of chapters, they were really short, so I'm combining two chapters into one episode. Um, the cringiest stuff I've ever read. Like, mind-blowingly embarrassing. I just can't believe that she is conducting herself like this. I'm like, girl, aren't you embarrassed though? Like. The first chapter is called Manhunt, and it's all about how she is on a journey to find herself a man. Meantime, she's also trying to put herself out there. She's hired this company to um, help promote her. It's all coming to naught because there's nothing to promote. That's the first chapter, it's called Manhunt. And then the second chapter we're talking today about is called The Influencer. And so it's, it's her journey to um, put herself out there on social media, but particularly with her website, the TIG. And it's just embarrassing stuff. It's like, I mean, here's the thing though. I mean, I'm reading it and I'm thinking to myself, gosh, this girl, like, how could she not be embarrassed? But then I also feel like there was a time in the beginning of social media culture when the term selfie I thought was so embarrassing. I still think it is. I mean, truly, when you think about that term, it's just so self-promotional. But I think that her use of that whole culture, I mean, I guess, why shouldn't she? Why shouldn't she make money off of the fact that everyone is self-promotional? Why shouldn't she be self-promotional also? I think it's just more like, I'm embarrassed for her, but I'm kind of embarrassed for our culture too. That, that people like this can come into the world and then we go and we read their blogs. We go watch their self-promotional stuff all over. Instagram and and all I mean it, it's like we should be embarrassed that we are giving a platform to all of these people who just want to talk about themselves like why are we allowing this in society so at the same time that I'm like horrified by her I also realize that she's just doing what everybody else is doing but in this context I just I feel like I felt when I first heard the term selfie like ew what why would you do that that's gross like why are you so into yourself anyway Oh, buckle up, y'all. It's it's distressing. It's distressing to see someone act like this. I, I think that's the thing. Reading these two chapters, I thought to myself, oh, this is depressing. I'm depressed for this person. <laughs> this is all their life was? Like, on a literal manhunt for a man? And like, you guys need to hear her tactics for finding somebody. It's like, it is so incredibly middle school. I, you know, when we were reading Spare, I kept talking about his arrested development. What about her arrested development? Why is she so childish? Okay, um, let's get on to it. Uh, oh, let's see. Is there anything from the last episode that we need to discuss? Um, nothing really. Thank you to the several people who let me know how much she'd really spent on that watch. That was a ton of money. We got several different prices, but it was all just insanity on insanity, close to about six thousand dollars. I, I, different people quoted things between six and ten thousand dollars, so that was pretty shocking. And then the only other thing that I feel like came up a lot in the comments were the fact that it's really strange, and I did not put a fine enough point on this at the time when I read it. I thought. That's bananas. But then I didn't really say much about it. I don't even know why. I think because there was just so much other things to say. But a couple of people were like, that's kind of interesting that she's just over there handing out drugs at her wedding. And I thought so too. <laughs> I have never gone to a wedding. And I granted, like, I'm not going to like it that a wedding. But I've never gone to a wedding where people are handing out bags of drugs. Being like, here, get high at our wedding. That's weird. And it really does make it 
really clear why in Spare, Harry is suddenly super cool with spreading his drug use. Like, I feel like being married to her, it completely normalized his drug use to him. Like, I think, first of all, I think we can all collectively agree that he probably didn't write Spare. But say like he did. He did read it. He did say those were his words. So he's putting his stamp of approval on everything that was said. He's very open about his drug use and very open about his use of psychedelics and, you know, various other things to sort of take the edge. And I think that as, as long as he was with the royal family, it was like, I can't mention the fact that I'm dabbling in the dark arts over here. But then once he's with Megan, she clearly is fine with it. I mean, you think about the fact that she grew up with a mother who was totally fine with using drugs around the stepkids. I'm sure she didn't just cut that off when Megan came along. And now she, we see her handing out, you know, weed to the wedding guests so that, you know, everybody can just smoke and get high and, you know, have a good time. If you would incorporate that into your wedding, you're incorporating that into life. Like nobody, nobody is over here for the very first time of their whole life handing out drinks at a wedding. You know what I mean? Like if you'd never been a drinker, you wouldn't suddenly be like, oh, I need to incorporate alcohol and into my wedding. And it was not, not like part of who, like that's not how you have a good time. You know what I mean? Like people who are like, don't drink, typically have a dry wedding. So she's over here handing out weed. Well, that's cause she does weed in her real life. Like that's that, that's enjoyable for her. And I know people have various ideas about weed and you know, whether it's a big deal or not. Whatever, as it stands, it's a drug right now. She's handing drugs out at her wedding. So then, you know, Usher and Harry, and she's fine with the drugs and she's probably encouraging his drug use, especially as he's going to various, you know, therapies and everything like this. And so much of therapy right now is incorporating various forms of psychedelics because it's not a drug, you know, it's medicine. And I, it just doesn't surprise me now after reading some of the things that we're reading in this book that, that this is why Harry feels he can now speak about it. Like, it's just no thing. Okay, that was a long aside. Let's get into the material. Like, comment, subscribe, send to a friend, and, you know, hit that bell for notifications. You guys know the song and dance. All right, chapter five, Manhunt. So, Megan, in an attempt to project herself continually and constantly into everybody's living rooms. She decided that the time had come for her to hire a PR agency. And this little business is not cheap. It, this is costing her $7,500 a month to get these people to help promote her image. And so the agency that she hired was one little <laughs> agency called Sunshine Sex. You guys, all right. She didn't, she's not working with like a bunch of nobodies here. These people are cutthroat and they have worked for Ben Affleck, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Leonardo DiCaprio, Justin Timberlake, Jennifer Lopez, Snoop Dogg, and Natalie Portman. So a bunch of names we actually know. They are a PR company. They're also a crisis management company. So they're here to help just make life real smooth for you. And at $7,500 a month, you guys better be. You know, can you imagine paying that much and like nothing comes of it? <laughs> I think not. Um, now, the origins of this particular company, questionable. And the guy who runs it, real questionable. As it stands, uh, he is, the guy who runs it, his name is Ken Sunshine. He's 69 years old. He used to be in politics and then he became a publicist. Um, and he has big ties with the Democrat Party. Um, he worked with George McGovern, Mario Cuomo, Bill de Blasio, very proudly has worked with the Clintons. I feel like that tells me all I need to know. And this is the thing. People said that this crisis management group might be called Sunshine, but they're up to some murky business. And even Ken Sunshine has said himself, we don't play it safe. We're not genteel. He says we name names and we battle the media when we have to. And they've e people have even said that they go into Wikipedia pages of various clients of theirs and they will change entries if need be to remove negative material. So right up Megan's alley. Change the past. You guys are going to do that for me? Absolutely sign me up. Here's my $7,500 a month to do so. So 
I mean, it just sounds like the, I mean, this is a match made in heaven, Sunshine Sachs and Meghan Markle. But the problem is, is that she just is a nobody. So it's, I mean, quite a lot is being asked of these people that they help her because I mean, it, it, this is like somebody says, I need to, you know, I'm hungry. Where's my plate to put my food on? And somebody hands you a lump of wet clay. You're supposed to make a plate out of this. I mean, there's just nothing here that w that's suiting anybody's needs. And you'll go on. Like, they keep trying to set her up with stuff. It all falls flat because she's not what they need. Okay. Uh, so, their earliest attempts to make a star of Megan began uh, in 2013. And she attended um, this Elle magazine celebration of West Hollywood women in television. Um, but the media coverage didn't even hardly hit on Megan. I mean, they didn't even notice her. Like, who would? I, I don't think it's... I cannot stress enough how little anybody knew Meghan Markle. And, I mean, we do know that. We know that we didn't know who she was. But it's just to hear her tell the tale. Now, I'm not saying there was nobody on the planet who knew about her. Because, at, come to find out, there were more people than anyone realized who knew her. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I think it... It would, it would appear that, I mean, it's just shocking. Every time you find out that anyone knew who Meghan Markle was, it's always like, really? You knew who she was? Wow. Because who was she? All right. So um, the PR team has decided that it's not happening for her, her here in America. Let's send her over to England. Maybe we can get some traction over there. So they sent her in 2013 over to England. And her first stop was Trinity College in Dublin. Now, at this college, the Philosophical Society had sent out dozens of invitations to different celebrities hoping to get somebody to answer their invitation to come to their event. And at, at various times, they had had some individuals show up of some note. Angela Merkel, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, you know, so people that we've heard of had answered the call of the Philosophical Society at Trinity College. Well, this year, not very many people replied. And one of those people was Megan. And the students were like, oh, well, I mean, nobody even knows her. It was like, it was a blow that this is the only person that they could get. Um, and some of the students were skeptical that anybody in the audience would even know who Rachel Zane was. You know, like, I guess we can have this girl. But I mean, people are gonna be disappointed. As it turned out, people showed up to see Meghan Markle, probably because she was like a celebrity from America. You know what I mean? Like, maybe you haven't heard of her, but she is from America and she's from Hollywood and maybe that's interesting, you know? So the, the students who'd organized it were shocked by how, by the positive reception that they had because the pessimists among the group had decided, let's not give her our prestigious honorary patronage award. We got to give her something. She came all this way. But they had were prepared to give her this plastic Brom Stoker medal instead um, so that they could present her something, but, you know, not offend the masses who'd come to see somebody famous. But, as I've stated, they were surprised. Look who should show up. Well, the students were kind of, like, in awe of her because she came um, styled to impress a student audience. You know, she's got this little sweater on and she's got these distressed skinny jeans and she's wearing these black stilettos. She's carrying this Louis Vuitton bag. All the sorts of things that would impress a mass of people who just don't know any better. Um, and as it would appear, Suits did have a small following at this college or at least people who wanted to see her. Now, Megan gets up and gives a speech all about Rachel Zane. I found that odd. I mean, if you went to go see a celebrity speak at a at a student event, and then they spend the entire time talking about their character, and they almost couldn't separate themselves from the character, I would be disappointed that there wasn't more to the individual. Like, yeah, but you are, but like, what do you do when you're not being Rachel, though? Like, what do you have to say to me beyond that? You know, and I, I, I'm surprised that anybody was fine with what she got up and said. But apparently, the students found her likable, and they admired the way she'd found an ability to play this character so closely to herself, that, that seemed to impress the students, rather than to note the fact that she's just playing herself. It's not like she's, it's not like she brought this character to life off the page that had no resemblance to herself. 
this is, this is her. But anyway, she gets up, she gives a speech. She says um, about Rachel Zane, as though this is some really deep and meaningful and historic drama on television. She gets up to talk about Rachel Zane and she's like, Rachel is layered and, and humanized. Even though she seems so confident, she really has all those insecurities and vulnerabilities. And I relate to that as a woman. And I think fans will too. It's like, what are you even talking about? Why are you coming here to talk about suits? You haven't been called here to talk about suits. You're so, like, the student society would like to hear you come and talk about being a woman of the world. You know, what bits of advice do you have for us? We don't want you to hear you sit here and t talk about the character of Suits. This isn't like you're on stage at the end of, you know, Sundance Film Festival and they're asking you questions about the movie we just watched. You are here to be more than just this character. I don't know. I just, it's disappointing. But I mean, really, quite frankly, what could we have expected Megan to talk about? Because that's what go on to read in this chapter and in the next. This girl's got nothing going on inside her head. Okay, so after she gets done talking to all the girls, she hustles on down to Dicey's, which was a popular haunt for students to promote E2 drinks. So, I mean, it's just, you know, promotional, promotional, promotional. I mean, that's why she's here. Thanks to Sun Sunshine Sacks. Well, again, thanks to Sunshine Sacks, she um, has been paired up with this publicity agent from Insanity Group who had been hired to negotiate publicity for Megan in the tabloids. So... Try as this man might, he cannot get anybody to care that Meghan Markle is in town. He is going to all kinds of gossip and show, showbiz journalists. He's calling up all of these paparazzi to see, you know, will you show up? Will you come? Will you take pictures? Nobody could care less. Why would they waste their time? There's real celebrities in England. So after incessantly pestering this woman named Katie Hind, a junior reporter of the Sunday People, which is a comparatively small circulation paper. So it's not like a big deal at all, but finally he manages to get somebody to care, somebody take a bite. He gets Katie Hind to reluctantly agree to a meeting with Megan. So, you guys, I feel so sorry for Katie Hind. Okay, because when we go on to discuss what they talked about in this little girl meeting, it is the stuff of nightmares. Okay, so they meet together on this rooftop of Sanctum Soho Hotel. What a shock. Um, they're both drinking Prosecco. And, and, you know, in her engaging way, Tom Bauer says that she's got an engaging way. I think that she just has this way about her in which she tries to pretend like she's really laying on some intimate details about herself. Like, oh, sorry, TMI, but I'm, just going, I'm, going, I'm going to go ahead and share. Like that whole attitude. Um, she tells Katie Hines that... She's just not really keen on American men. And she's just discounted finding anybody in America. It's just not gonna happen for her. American men are just the worst. And she says that by contrast, she likes Englishmen. And these are her two selling points about why Englishmen are so much better. Number one, they call women darling. Do you guys call women darling? And number two, they're suckers for a compliment. So this is the big thing. This is what sets British men apart. The fact that they they have a nickname that she prefers and the fact that they are manipulable and that she can manage them by just throwing out a couple of compliments. I mean, we, uh, Harry is unfortunately proof that this is possible because how many times did she met out little compliments to him to keep coming back? But anyway, this is what she thinks of you, British men. Be offended. You're more than calling women darling and you're not an idiot that just stumbles over themselves for a dumb compliment. Anyway, this is why she says she needs an Englishman and she keeps wondering if, you know, Katie Hind might know somebody. And she says that she believes, you know, she can find her own man in England. I mean, it'd be awesome if you know somebody, but I can probably find my own guy because I am awesome at networking. It's, it's gonna probably be no thing for me once, you know, because I, it's, I have developed networking down to a fine art. This is These are her words, that she knows how to network and that she's developed it to a fine art. I, I, the whole concept of networking to me is gross. Use, use, use people. I'm gonna use you, you use me. Scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Gross. 
Okay, well, anyway, she's over here bragging about herself. Katie Hyde is bemused. I mean, uh, she's, okay, <laughs> good for you, you know. But anyway, unexpectedly, the conversation takes another turn. <laughs> I just can't with this. It's too good. Okay, so she says to Katie, um, what do you know about Ashley Cole? Because he's kind of after me in a little way. <laughs> Um, so like, here's a picture of him and she gets out her phone and she shows him a picture. She shows Katie a picture of Ashley Cole, who's the footballer for England and Chelsea. <clears throat> and which obviously is the British term in America. We would say he's a soccer player, but I'm trying to use the right words. Okay. So anyway, he plays for Chelsea in England and Megan says that Cole has been following her on Twitter. <laughs> Amazing, right? And she says that they've been exchanging messages. He's all up in my DMs. Could you believe it? So what do you think about him? Like, kind of a catch, right? And Katie Hines like, hmm. Do not go down the road with that guy. That guy is such a cheater. He's constantly cheating on his wife. His lifestyle is very erratic. I, I do not think that this is the man. This is not the English man that you're looking for. Megan's like, oh, no, what? Like super disappointed. Like she can't, like, but for a little digging, you could have find out, found out the guy was married. And are you just okay with that? That this married guy is messaging you? That you and him have this little thing going on Twitter off on the side? This is just a-okay to you? Okay, that's one way to live your life. Um, but an interesting little side note here is that Ashley Cole says, Meghan Markle, we never had a thing. No, the cast of Suits, according to Cole, the cast of Suits sent me a message. They said that they were fans or something. But Meghan and I don't have a thing going on. And he says that nothing's happened and he doesn't really know what she was talking about. But see, I call BS on this because all of his friends on the side have been saying, oh yeah, Ashley's always talking about the fact that Meghan Markle's after him. I mean, sh he says that she is chasing him, but they, there's something going on there. Okay, let's just talk you and I. Both of them, acting foolishly, if you ask me. Both of them messaging back and forth. Now, Cole, it is not, it, she's divorced. Now it's in his best interest to act like it's all on her, that, that she's the one that's been coming after him like some kind of a maniac. Um, however, what we do know about Megan is that she would come after somebody like a maniac. What I think is that he and she were definitely talking, but now he's got to play it off like it was like no thing. But that, I mean, that's kind of a lame excuse. Like the, he recalls that the cast of Suits sent him a message. What cast of any show gets together and gathers around the computer and goes, hey, um, let's come on, you guys. Let's all together go in and, 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 and send a little message to Ashley Cole. Tell him we're big fans. I mean, I don't I don't know what, what kind of cast does that. Like, what, what, what is that? So. I, I don't, I don't buy that excuse. That's lame. I think we can all agree that Cole and, and Megan are together talking back and forth, being flirty. And she was hoping to turn that into something when she came to England. And he was definitely like, oh, just having fun. Just wasting time. Okay. So she's over there being shady as I'll get out. Um, anyway, so after... Poor Katie Hind. Can you imagine, like, can you imagine listening to this the whole time? Her showing you pictures on the phone of somebody that you're well acquainted with. You, you know who the guy is. It's not a big deal. He's kind of a big philanderer anyway. Um, they finish the conversation by bemoaning the fact that they're both 32 years old and single and they don't have any prospects and they don't have any idea of how to get any prospects. Um, and then Megan just kind of ended the night by going back to her hotel. And Hind was just like, this girl is just craves publicity and I'm not really interested in giving her another platform because there's no story here this girl's boring I, nothing that we talked about tonight was of worth note I don't care so 
Megan made no no waves there at Katie Hines paper okay well that's she's not ready to go home yet she's got other engagements so now she's supposed to be going to this fashion gala with the model Oliver Cheshire she didn't know this guy but she's standing there on the red carpet holding his hand and she just wanted nothing more than have her photo in the tabloid papers the next day she just prayed for it somebody care but the editors just rejected her and because the readers had no interest in Miss Nobody. Nobody want, Nobody's going to pick up the paper to read about a celebrity you don't even know. Who cares? So, um, it continues to get worse. While she is at this event, she meets this individual named Lizzie Cundy, who, according to Tom Bauer, is a glamour-seeking TV personality. I don't know this person. Maybe y'all do. But anyway, over a drink, Megan confesses that Hollywood has just been so brutal to her. And she's had such a hard time getting a leg up in that absolute rat race. But maybe in England, she can finally have her breakthrough. And she says that her ambition is to be featured on an English reality TV show like Made in Chelsea or something like that. And then she says that she really wants an English boyfriend. So she starts peddling that Ashley Cole story again. Girl, it's not happening. This Lizzie Cundy isn't going to suddenly tell you a different story. This Ashley Cole is over there cheating on his wife right, left, and center. Okay? Everybody knows this. So it's not going to be a different story. And what do you think? Like, Lizzie Cundy's got some kind of in with you? If you and this guy are over here messaging on Twitter 24-7, you guys just can't stay out of each other's DMs. You don't need to have an in with all these ladies. You could just be like, hey, I'm here. You want to hang out? You know what I mean? But like, she doesn't have what she's even trying to say she has. Okay, so anyway, I wanna be on a reality show um, and I wanna get an English boyfriend. Then she says, and this is where I was just like, Ey. this is so embarrassing for you. She says to Lizzie, do you know any famous guys? I'm single and I'm, I really love English men. Do you know anyone who's free? This is so embarrassing. Like, stop begging, get up off the floor. Quit groveling, like this is just, humiliating to read do you know any famous guys i'm single do you know anyone who's free i'm free do you know anybody do you know anybody do you know anybody it's like oh my gosh please stop once again she brings up ashley cole he's following me on twitter cundy's own marriage to a football player was <laughs> on the rocks and she was not interested in sending Megan down some trail with this Ashley Cole individual. And so she's like, no, I don't think you need to get involved with him or quite frankly, any other footballer because these guys are living, you know, they're running their own program and it doesn't involve wives. Well, Megan was disappointed. So at the end of the evening, she goes her way, you know, Lizzie goes hers and there's no pictures in the paper. Nobody cared that she was there. Um, there was one passing mention in the Daily Mail but there was no picture. So, I mean, if you don't know Megan, you're not gonna like suddenly connect the dots. Oh yeah, I know that face, you know. Well, it continues to get even more cringy. Like, I just didn't know it was possible. I didn't know that anyone could act like this. So Sunshine Sachs has booked her an appearance at a TV gala. And they've also arranged for her to meet this guy named Jonathan Shalit, who was a successful and very likable TV agent. She tells him, this TV agent, um, I want to be a TV celebrity chef like Gordon Ramsay. Doesn't that require some cooking knowledge, right? I mean, I'm sorry. What are you talking about? You want to be like Gordon Ramsay, a celebrity chef, but you don't know how to cook. You don't like, you can't just want to do things, but you don't have any skill level. What is, what is this? What are we, like Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> Dear girl. Do you not understand the way the world works? Are you so confused? Okay, so she's like, yeah, I wanna do that. Or, you know, I'd be happy to be here on, you know, really any kind of nondescript TV show. Like, whatever you got, I, I'm here for it. But really, because I'm such a foodie, I'd love to do something with food. Um, and Charlotte was excited about Megan because she does have an engaging personality. She can make a good first impression. She was charming and good looking and you know she's got a small audience on suit so he thought maybe there was something that they could do along these lines you know and the problem is he was just so unaware of Megan's lack of skills right I mean Tom Bauer writes other than blender made vegetable soup her specialties were plain pasta 
roast chicken, barbecued hamburgers and steak. So basically anything anybody could make. She, she was, you know, up to par on those things. The rest of her food was bought ready-made. Okay, so this is gonna be a real problem if you're gonna be a celebrity chef. Also, how, how, celebrity chef, you're neither a celebrity nor a chef. So explain to me why anyone would tune into this. So she then could, begins to flesh out her idea. And so she's like, well, okay, uh, rather than cook, um, I'll be, you know, like the face of the TV program and I'll just tour the world eating different things and you guys can film me. And that is a, that's an idea for a show right there. That's an idea for a show. No, it's not. Who cares what your opinion of food is? And Tom Bauer goes on to remind us that she was in this short video of tasting pickles in Brooklyn for Aura TV and it really exposed her limitations. Boy, does it ever. I went and I found this clip. And my problem here is that Megan is, she's pleasant in the video. She's not like mean or anything. Um, but if you are here to taste a bunch of different pickles, which is what she's doing, like there's pickled okra, there's pickled green beans, there's pickled cucumbers, there's all kinds of pickled things. And she and um, Haley Duff, of all people, are over here sampling the pickles of Brooklyn. And, you know, she's just eating all that. Mmm, 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 that's good. I like that one's good. I taste some cumin. But it's like, it's not interesting if you like everything. If everything, I mean, it's her her descriptions of what she were e eating, uninteresting. She didn't have anything to be like, oh, this one's really good. I, I don't know about this one over here. Like, if you like everything, why am I watching? Because that's not interesting. Like, what are your varied opinions about the different pickles? What is really good? What's not good? What do you, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, it, it's not a review if everything is the same good. And it's like you said, cheers, do cheers, girl. <laughs> Oh wow! It's also got really nice flavor. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is like Thanksgiving, right? Okay, See, I'm back. interested in the Let's okra situation go. here. See. Bottoms up. There we go. Mmm. Mm. It tastes it gets better and better as you go. Smokiness. It's usually a texture thing for people. People don't but... like that sliminess on the inside of okra. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So anyway, um, she tastes the pickles, and it's clear that she has no magic or magnetism when it comes to food. So the program idea just sort of evaporated, and then. Poor Charlotte's trying to find something for her to do. And he says, well, maybe uh, I could get you an audition for Strictly Come Dancing. But she can't do that because the filming schedule for that clashes with her suits filming. So she's got to go home. Her little journey to England came to naught. She's got to return to Toronto with neither work nor new man. What a crushing blow. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter about Manhunt. Now we're going on to this other chapter called Influencer. Tom Power is both insightful and cutting in his bluntness on this chapter. Megan is just shameless in the self-promotion. I mean, as we can see, can you imagine sitting down at a table with somebody you never knew and pulling out your phone and being like, look at this guy who's following me on Twitter. And it's like this serial cheater. I mean, it's, it, it's humiliating that she would even think that that was some kind of an end. Anyway, she's not deterred it seems like rejection only fuels her ambitions because here we have it didn't work out for me in England Sunshine Sax is not doing all they could for me but I it's fine I'll make my own way in the world I'll become an influencer so on her 33rd birthday on August 2014 so about a year after she'd been in England under the headline birthday suit she posted a seductive topless side shot of herself and her self-justification for self-objectifying was pertinent. She says, I don't see beauty and empowerment as separate things. Self-empowerment and women's rights, I put them in the beauty section. Okay, if that's what you gotta tell yourself. If you need to put up a picture of yourself without a shirt on to get attention so that you feel better about yourself, that is not self-empowerment. If you need other people to tell you how to feel about yourself, that is not self-empowerment. And if you get off on looking at pictures of yourself without your clothes on, you have deeper problems than any of us can solve. So I don't understand exactly how she can. So whatever she wants to tell herself, but I am so annoyed by people who post 
pictures of themselves clearly to get attention and then say they did it for themselves. Okay, well then take a few extra minutes to look at yourself before you hop in the shower. You know what I'm saying? Like if it's all just for you, then why do I need to see it? Okay, anyway. Um, she's just not sure how long this whole Suits gig is gonna last, you know? And so she's got to decide, she's gotta make her own way in the world. Suits could dry up at any moment. You know, and that's the problem with being an actor because you just never know when it's all going to end. But Megan decided that she should register a couple of websites um, so that maybe she can come up with some kind of lifestyle brand. Listen to the names of some of these websites that she registered. I mean, the TIG's bad enough. But she's got Posh Beauty, blah, Fork Me, Spoon Me, Lolly Tots, and Foodie Pup. Booty pup, lolly tots. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Fork me, spoon me. It's so lame, you guys. I just, I'm just, ah, oh, it's so lame. It's so lame. I don't even have words. My vocabulary is drying up. My mind cannot comprehend. Okay, so she just got her leverage, her celebrity. That's the thing. She's got to make herself a household name. And so, um, she decides that this is the path she's gonna go down. Of course, it's not an original idea. What celebrity among us now doesn't have some kind of lifestyle brand, something that they're over here chucking in our face 24 seven just to keep themselves relevant. And she, Megan's big skill was to copy what she'd seen going on around her. So she, she sees, you know, that, that this is the next thing. This is what you do between projects. You promote yourself in other ways. Um, and she had a couple of friends who were also in the self-promotion business. Sophie Trudeau is over here trying to establish herself as a gender equality activist. And then her other friend, Jessica, Jessica Mulroney, is over here trying to find some kind of online identity. And so Megan realized that the trick that you need is to establish some kind of a brand. What's my brand? And so she decided that she was going to have some kind of, uh, blog about her opinions and lifestyle. Um, she was going to promote factual causes and, you know, do endorsements and all this sort of stuff. For the first year, none of her websites took off. <laughs> what a surprise. I mean, would you click on something called foodie pups? That sounds dangerous. Um, fork me, spoon me. Eww, I don't know where that's going, but I'm not sure that I want to find out. So I'm not surprised things didn't go well for her. Um, and inspiration junkie, I mean, she would be. Remember when she tells Harry that she's going to go on the whole like eat, pray, love journey? That is just so typical, Megan, I cannot even. I remember when I made that video, a bunch of people were like, you know, it's not just a movie, it's a book. Yeah, I know it's a book. I just can't imagine being inspired by it. Okay, anyway, so the next big idea, the website that finally takes off is she has this website called The Tig. And it's named after this Italian wine, Tinanello. Now, I don't even know if that's the right pronunciation, but I do know the G is silent in that word. So the fact that she calls the website the TIG is even more embarrassing since she's the one that's always talking about how she is so cultured. She knows what's going on in the world of food and wine. Hmm. But you named your website after a wine in which the G is silent, but it certainly isn't silent in the TIG. Anyway. Um, so the, she's working with this guy named Jake Rosenberg. He's a Canadian born designer of Coverture magazine. So it's not like she's over here doing it by herself. This isn't some sort of homespun endeavor. She launches it in May, 2014. And she describes herself as the editor in chief of this lifestyle brand. It's a website to flaunt wealth, luxury clothes, a glamorous jet setters lifestyle, wellness. The TIG, she wrote, is a hub for the discerning palette. Those with a hunger for food, travel, fashion, and beauty. And to be a breeding ground for ideas and excitement for an inspired lifestyle. Well, I'm not inspired by this phrase, a breeding ground for ideas. Do you know what a breeding ground is? It's disgusting. I just, I, that, I, Megan is just no writer. That's just all it comes down to. What kind of a visual, what kind of a mental visual is that? All right, whatever. Uh, Megan's routine continues on. She goes to the studio in the morning, then she goes to the gym after that, and then it's straight home to find content for the website. The girl is not lazy when it comes to this. I mean, she's like slogging to get this website off the ground. And she is an assiduous 
researcher. She combs all kinds of things, the highbrow magazines, the lowbrow magazines. She's looking for snippets everywhere. She's trawling websites all over the idea, looking for free products from luxury brands in exchange for promoting handbags and, 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 and various clothing items. She's emailing endless celebrities for comments and endorsements. I mean, the girl is working her fingers through the bone She's just trying to build up her credibility. And the thing is that she she needs to have some pictures of her with celebrities. Like, that's the problem. Like, it's all well and good for her to be over here pretending, but she's got to have evidence that these people are her friends. And so to build her credibility, she's trying to associate with stars, get photographs of them to prove their friendship. And the celebrity hunter's strength was to seize every opportunity and never take no for an answer. So she's over here finding her trying to find an inn to where there might be celebrities so that she can get some pictures with them. She finds herself at this soccer match um, at New York's Pier 40 on the Hudson River. And one of the people there in attendance was Serena Williams. Okay, well, then Megan bumps into Serena Williams and then has this whole thing on her website about how she and Serena are besties. Yet somehow there is no photo evidence of this. Although she says in the piece on her website, we hit it off immediately, taking pictures, laughing and chatting, not about tennis or acting, but about good old fashioned girly stuff. We began our friendship. Noticeably though, there's no photo of Megan and Serena, even though Megan's like, we were just laughing, talking, snapping selfies. Well, where, where are these selfies then? Okay, well, Brett Ratner, do you guys remember that guy who threw all the parties that Megan would go to and stay till dawn? Well, he dated Serena Williams, and he says Serena never mentioned Meghan Markle a day in her blessed life. Um, and even though Meghan had never held a tennis racket and had no reason to ever run into Serena for any reason, she claims that she and Serena were united by their endless ambition. Well, Serena Williams has some natural skills and talents. She doesn't have to be just be like crazy ambitious and wild and weird and trying to promote herself all the time because she's got real skill level. I'm sure you both are ambitious, but very in very different ways. Also, she wanted to promote the idea that she and Ivanka Trump are great besties. She says, uh, she writes on her website to her readers, when we have drinks, I will make sure I order whatever she does because this woman seems to have the formula for success and happiness down pat. Oh, is the drink, is that is that where you start ordering the right, the same drink as the other girl and then suddenly you'll have the formula for success and happiness? This is such boring writing. I cannot even imagine. Can you imagine every day being like, I'm gonna log in and see what she has to say on the TIG. Did any of y'all read that like legitimately? Because if you did, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I just can't imagine every, anybody tuned into that website because they just loved what Megan had to say. Megan realized that to get readers, and apparently she was amassing some following. I think by the end of it, she had like 100,000 followers, which is not nothing. But she realized that the way to get people pulled in was to sort of conjure up sort of an intimate personal revelation style of writing. Um, she would lace it with colorful fantasies. There didn't need to be a whole lot of truth to any of it. I mean, like, you know, Megan just did not have a totally faithful relationship to the truth on this website. I mean, she would tell you a lot of things that had like versions, flavors, shades of the same color, but not the truth truth. And I mean, you see this, uh, we saw this in the very beginning chapter when she wrote the story about um, how her dad gave her the Barbie doll set that had you know, uh, white Barbies and black Barbies in the set, the family set, so that she could, you know, it would be a mixed race Barbie set. And she really writes it in what a whole other way than it really happened. So it's like, she's kind of telling the truth, but it's like, if it's going to be more appealing, she'll change the facts if need be. You know, she's just looking for content here. She presented herself as a racy Hollywood goddess she mentioned her love of good food, copious amounts of rosé, oh, spicy tequila cocktails and neat scotch. Describing herself in one post as a saintly hippie, she disparaged fancy restaurants and pledged herself as good company, embracing every little second of it. I just find this nauseating. 
I'm going to tell you, if somebody wants to sit there and tell me that they are all about copious amounts of rosé, I mean, I'm out. I am out. That is such a cliche. Like, come on, get a personality. Oh, it's just horrible. Okay, but then listen, she goes on on her website to tell us about her ideal man. And this harkens back to how she wants to marry and or meet or date an Englishman because they use the word darling and they love a compliment. Like very low standards here. Okay, she says, dressed in a linen shirt, him barefoot on the beach, eating a slice of pizza, inviting me back for a drink on the way home. This is all that it takes for her. She writes presents of lingerie from him are always nice. I want a bold adventurer. And she writes, I think it's important to roll with the punches and enjoy every minute of it. If he makes me laugh, that helps. This is all it takes? A man in a linen shirt eating pizza on the beach asks you for, uh, if you want to go home, buys you, you know, some new panties, and this is it for you? I'm sorry, what? Megan, Megan, you, you want more though, right? Surely, you want more. That's it for you though? <laughs> If he makes me laugh, you know, that's cool too. Oh gosh. But the result of the website, it just reflects a woman who just is very, has very commercial sensitivity. Um, a chancer with a very limited sense of humor. This is what Tom Bauer writes. She's a chancer with a very limited sense of humor. And I have to say, I agree because nothing that she says here is designed to ever rock the boats or be interesting of any kind. It's not interesting to just say the same things everybody else is saying. Nobody's going to tune in for that for long. You know, you might, I mean, after a while, people can only care so much about your crisp white duvets and your glass of rosé. Okay, so anyway, on her 33rd birthday, she gives us this little post, you know, with the side boob, and then she wants to talk about her recipe for happiness. And she gives us this long litany, like she's really come upon the answers in life. But all you can do is read it and be like, no, this is what you are wishing you felt, but you don't feel this way. She writes, you need to know that you're enough. A mantra that has now ingrained itself so deeply within me that not a day goes by without hearing it chime in my head. That five pounds lost won't make you happier. That more makeup won't make you prettier. And the now iconic saying from Jerry Maguire, you complete me, frankly, isn't true. You are complete with or without a partner. You are enough just as you are. So for my birthday, here's what I would like as a gift. I want you to be kind to yourself. I want you to challenge yourself. I want you to stop gossiping, to try a food that scares you, to buy a coffee for someone just because, to tell someone you love them, and then to tell yourself right back. I want you to find your happiness. I did and it's never felt so good. I am enough. Is that why you're trotting around England trying to find Ashley Cole who could care less about you? Is that is that happiness? If that's happiness, no thank you. I, 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 no, no, I won't have a slice of happy pie. No, no thank you. Can you imagine? Like, Megan, everything that you're saying here are things that you wish were true about yourself. You wish that you felt like you were enough. You wish that you didn't believe that last five pounds would make a difference. You wish you didn't have to put on so much eye makeup. You wish all of these things were true. You're complete with or without a partner. Then why are you looking for a man? This, this is not true stuff. This is what you, this is what you know you're supposed to say. Uh, for my birthday, I would really like you to give yourself the gift of saying you love yourself. No, you don't. Nobody wants that for their birthday. Where are my presents? Okay. Just stop with this. I, that, this is so stupid. And, and I, I think this is the thing that offends me the most. It's that she believes that women out there are stupid enough to be okay with this vapid foolishness. I hate that, that women are, are that, that women do this to each other. You are not stupid. And by me saying, let's talk about Rose and that we're enough with our pictures of side boobs. Like that is offensive. We, women, we are too smart to settle for this kind of stupidity, okay? Where, where is the meaty conversations? Where's the truth? Where, where, where's the, 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 the interesting dialogue? 
We, we are so much more than paint colors on a wall and, and fluffy duvets. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with enjoying beauty. There's nothing wrong with enjoying food and wine and good times. Absolutely nothing. But like this kind of vapid talk about, I want you to stop gossiping. I want you to try a food that scares you. I want you to tell somebody you love them and say it right back to yourself. Ladies, come on. Isn't that annoying when another woman talks to you like this? It's just like so boring. Okay, rant over. Um, but as Tom Bauer, oh, I love this man. He writes and he says, the homily on the tig did not always entirely reflect her own life or occasionally even her personal values. <laughs> As a purely commercial venture, she understood her market and how to compartmentalize between her real life and the fantasy life she offered her increasing number of followers, which was now heading towards a 100,000 mark. Conjuring fantasies was her unique selling point. The most noteworthy in Megan's list, composed for A Guide to Living Well, was the entry under the heading Non-Negotiable. Kindness. Oh, that's a non-negotiable, is it? All right, well, that's interesting because we don't see a whole lot of kindness in the way that you've dealt with your father, your best friend, your ex-husband. Anyway, this summer that she launches this TIG, she meets this guy named Corey Vidiello, who was a Toronto restauranteur who was famous for his burgers and his clientele. He was this handsome 35-year-old guy, and he welcomed Hollywood celebrities who were filming in Toronto to the Harvard Room. Corey was known for dating several well-known Canadian women, one of them was this multimillionaire businesswoman and politician. Um, so he had some cachet, I guess, in Megan's opinion. In July, after eating at his restaurant with the suits cast, Megan wrote a gushing review in the TIG. Corey was dubbed my very favorite chef. Like she even knows that many. Shortly afterwards, Corey ended his relationship and started to date Megan. And she made a good selection when she met Corey because he was the one who opened all sorts of doors for her. Bauer writes, through Corey, the life and soul of many parties and sought after by many women, Megan was introduced to everyone in Toronto. Swiftly, she became a fixture of the city's social life. Pertinently, Corey was never featured on the TIG. In the transactional nature of Megan's relationships with men and women, keeping Corey anonymous, was compatible with her own search for fame. So again, we see her, she's just using this guy. What connections does he have? How can, how can he further her career? How can he further what she knows about food? How can, how can he help her lifestyle brand? How can he help her get to know people? And that's the end of that chapter. But it's so gross how she just uses people with no intention of going any further with them. She just wants more notches in her belt. She just wants to know, I could get that guy, I could get that guy, I could get that guy. Everything is mine. Whatever I see, wherever my little eyes lay, I can have that guy if I want to. And I just think it must have been exhausting being this concerned about putting yourself front and center and getting likes and getting clicks and getting people to notice you and getting people to recognize you. It's just unbelievable that anyone would want to live life like this with no real relationships. I mean, this is the story of somebody with severe, severe personality disorder. Because I cannot imagine what could be less meaningful in life than to walk through your whole life looking for men who will fawn all over you, then breaking up with those men once you've, you've wrung everything out of them, looking, you know, constantly all night long, trolling online, looking for little bits for your website, you know, spending hours writing content of, about yourself and about your opinions and about what you want. It's just like, wouldn't you just get sick of yourself? Like, I'd be so sick and tired of talking about myself all the time and all the day long having to push myself forward and in every conversation looking for my in, looking how I can completely shift the tone of the conversation so we can talk about what I want to talk about. The, 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 the whole manhunt chapter that we read about how she's running around town showing everybody her phone. Look, look, it's Ashley Cole. We're talking on Twitter. And Ashley's like, I don't even know that girl. Like, that's embarrassing. And why in the world would you do that with people you don't even know? Like both instances when she's pulling out her phone, wanting to continue this, this talk about how him and me are mis messaging. These women don't know you. They don't know Ashley Cole either. 
I mean, a total and complete stranger running up to you, shoving their phone in your face and being like, me and this guy are talking. Okay. All right. So what? So what? Yeah, that guy and every other woman in England he's talking to, you know? So it's, I find it depressing. It depresses me to think that, that people like Megan are just over here failing up all over the place. And I don't understand how Megan has made it where she is. You know, there have been a couple of comments where people have said of Megan, is she some kind of an operative? Like, how is she managing this? I don't think that's the case. I mean, on one hand, I want to say that the state of our current government is so foolish that it wouldn't surprise me if they would pick somebody like Megan and think she could really seize the day and help them get things done. But I don't think there's some grand plan to ruin the monarchy through Meghan Markle and that, you know, she's working hand in glove with the CIA or something. But I do think that we just live in a society that is so devoid of any ability to think clearly so unable to use logic to any capacity that they wouldn't even see Megan coming. That somebody like, the, the fact that she had 100,000 people wanting to listen to her write on and on about give yourself a hug and drink your glass of rosé and you know, slip into that crisp bedding. Like the fact that and there were 100,000 people who wanted to read that is depressing. Because it's just like, What's the matter with our brains? What's happening to our minds? Why are we so incapable of thinking deeply about anything? So Megan doesn't need to be a CIA operative to get ahead. She's just dealing at a time and culture in which nobody has the ability or really the energy to care if they're being lied to. People don't care if they're being lied to. It's just like, how can I just go along to get along? Oh, is the whole world falling down around my ears? Well, so long as I've still got something, so long as I've still got my special coffee creamer, I guess I'm okay. You know, it's just like, golly. Megan, Megan was able to see what moment she lived in and she sees the day. And you know, Meg, Megan has an ability to somehow read what needs to be done. But again, as I've said a thousand times, she can read the room for only so long. And I think she's losing her ability to lose, to read the room currently. But we shall see. Uh, I mean, who knows? Who knows what will come of Megan? I'm just eager for the day when finally she casts Harry aside and we can, you know, turn our attention back to Harry and see what is he up to. All right. Well, uh, my hour has come, so I will leave you with that. But um, I hope you guys found this as deliciously enjoyable as I did. I, I mean, it's... I... I don't know, maybe maybe I'm the hypocrite for criticizing her for being vapid, but then also finding it incredibly humorous and laughing at it. Maybe that makes me vapid, I don't know. <laughs> I'll see you guys later this week, bye.